so thanks a lot for joining on this uh, session on securing the connected car. We'll see if more people join over time. It's always interesting to see the shocked expression on people's face when they make all this noise with the door. So we'll see if we can see that again. Um, but until then, uh, let's see what's happened to the car over the last uh, couple of uh, decades. Uh, you can see in the um, 1990s, you started to introduce electronics into the car. In uh, close to 2000, you have telematics, so basically um, how, what's the fuelage, fuel consumption, and how far you've driven, things like that, statistics about the car. Uh, then, early 2000, you're starting to get uh, infotainment systems, basically uh, maps and uh, entertainment, so information and uh, audio music systems. Uh, and then, towards close to 2010, you see the cars are starting to get more and more connected as well. So you can see this trend that there is uh, uh, more and more software that, that comes into the car up until today. And uh, going forward, right now there's a lot of focus on assisted driving in cars. So basically uh, assisted parking, for example, uh, and warning systems if you're outside your lane when you're driving. Uh, so basically to make the driving more safe. Uh, so obviously that's a lot of intelligence there as well. And going forward, you've seen a lot of articles about uh, what these bigger tech companies are focusing on in terms of automotive, uh, autonomous automotive, I should say. So um, yeah, uh, that's self-driving cars, basically. Um, so a lot of big names in that, like Apple, Google, uh, Uber, a lot of people, and existing uh, OEM uh, or car manufacturers as well are, are working a lot on that. Uh, so obviously when we get there, there will be a lot of software running in the cars. Um, and this has several implications. Uh, so just a short introduction after this overview. Uh, so my name is Einstein Stenberg. If you forget it, you can think about the German physicist. That's a very easy way to remember it, especially in the US. Um, on Starbucks, it's a classic. Uh, so I've worked on uh, systems management and security for about seven years now, background from cryptography. Uh, I'm working on a project called Mender.io, which creates an over-the-air updater. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, we also have a booth upstairs. So this is the rest of uh, the session broken down into these three pieces. Uh, so first of all, we'll have a look at what are the opportunities uh, that we will have once uh, this more uh, complicated or this more advanced um, technology environment unfolds in the car, basically, with, with more and more software. Uh, then we'll also have a look at uh, some of the security implications. We'll go through one. Uh, quite famous attack and go one level deeper to better understand what, what actually happened. Uh, and then finally, we'll have a look at uh, patching uh, cars and, and uh, patching in general, uh, what, how it can be addressed. So why is more and more software appearing in your cars every day? Um, so one re reason is obviously the uh, uh, more net revenue for the car manufacturers. So uh, a new thing with, with the cars, once you start to be able to connect them and update them and a lot of features are built on software, uh, you will see the same that's happening to your smartphone where, uh, where you can actually buy features after the car has rolled off the, the manufacturing plant. Uh, so this is now happening and, and people are starting to, to look into that. Uh, so there are some big numbers behind this as well. Uh, Tesla does this today. Uh, they are quite far ahead, as you might know, in, in the um, uh, car manufacturing space. Uh, 
so they had an OTA system that can uh, add uh, software after cars, so, so that consumers can buy additional uh, software after they um, purchase the car. Uh, so, on the other side of um, why uh, you see more and more software is that uh, you can also get cost savings, especially if you use open source software. Uh, so here is a typical IVI stack. So IVI, also a nice three-letter abbreviation, is uh, in vehicle infotainment. So basically, infotainment system. Uh, so at the top you have the HMI or the UI basically, and some applications, middleware, uh, maybe update their operating system, board support packages, hardware. So the interesting thing to take away is that uh, uh, the cost and, and value trade-off here is a bit skewed. So you can see the bottom layers are very expensive to maintain. Approximately 60% uh, of the time and effort we spend on these bottom layers. And uh, while the differentiation is happening at the top, because you have new applications or, or you have new features, that's what the users will notice, and that's how they recognize the, the brand of the car manufacturer. So uh, what makes sense here is to focus on having open source as these bottom layers, because there is no differentiation anyway. So um, that's what I think will happen, and it's uh, also what we uh, what has started to happen now uh, with projects like AGL automotive grade Linux uh, being becoming more and more popular um, because traditionally uh, all of the stack is uh, is developed by uh, the car manufacturers or contractors for them um, and yeah, I mentioned on OTA updates, uh, and uh, obviously with all this uh, software that we will see, uh, in particular open source software in the cars, uh, you need to be able to update it, because as you know, software contains bugs, and the more you have of it, the more bugs there will be, unfortunately. Um, so um, you can also see that reality in uh, today's recalls of cars, that 33% um, of them, there's a research by ABI Research, says that 33% uh, of them could have been avoided uh, if there were OTA updaters uh, available or installed on, on the cars. And this number will only grow. Uh, and there's a lot of, of savings, obviously. Uh, we'll have a look at um, one uh, hack Next, um, the Fiat Chrysler hack. How many of you have heard of it? Okay, almost everybody. Um, so that's good. Uh, so in that case, uh, 1.4 million vehicles uh, were recalled, which is obviously quite expensive. So um, hopefully you don't know the entire story and the sequence of events, because uh, that's what we'll have a look at. But this is um, the outcome, <laughs> so to speak. Um, there was um, a hack presented at Black Hat conference in 2015. Uh, and uh, by two researchers, they managed to get full control of a, uh, a car remotely and uh, control the steering, the brakes. Everything was under the attacker's control. And they didn't modify the car in advance either, so it was a true remote exploit. Uh, but the car didn't have any way, or the manufacturer didn't have any way to fix it once this happened, so that's why they had to recall 1.4 million cars. And uh, there's also an update from August uh, that they uh, extended the attack to uh, up, update the ECUs, uh, so we'll, we'll have a look at sort of the internals of the car, but uh, um, basically they could update all the microcontrollers as well over the can, canvas. Um, so to start off looking at how this happened, uh, 
we'll have a look at how the car is, is laid out in the beginning. So this is a um, head unit, uh, and it contains a Wi-Fi. So many of these um, cars do that because uh, they want to offer subscription services. Um, so for example, if you have, uh, um, so, uh, so basically the car has a 3G connection and then it can distribute that connection over Wi-Fi to all the passengers. So um, I still don't have kids myself, but uh, uh, I can see the scenario where it's useful where you can give kids a laptop or a tablet or something and then give them um, Wi-Fi access. Uh, and then you would, uh, would uh, subscribe to that from, from the car manufacturer. Um, so obviously you could potentially do tethering as well, but, but this is an alternative. Uh, and this Wi-Fi uh, was password protected. And uh, that's how the, the setup was. So what the researchers started with was to have a um, look at this password and, uh, and try to guess it, uh, which wasn't that hard. Uh, so it was based on the system time after the car was provisioned, uh, which is pretty much the same uh, before you uh, sort of have the actual clock set correctly. So it was pretty much January 1st, 2013, 0, 0, 0, plus minus a little bit. Uh, so you can guess that in uh, a couple of attempts. And then there was a software vulnerability in the multimedia system. So now you have, uh, um, so you have a car, you can guess the Wi-Fi, and you can breach into this, uh, this multimedia system. Um, so you could argue that this is not really a security or, or, well, definitely a security, but not that much of a safety issue because um, now you can go close to a car and you can maybe turn up the volume or uh, look up the GPS coordinates, but since you're so close to the car, it doesn't matter anyway because you know where you are. Um, so not that severe, maybe. Uh, so... Uh, what they did to make it more severe is that they breached the uh, 3G uh, Sprint network. So now you can do the same things uh, remotely. So you can look up where the car is. You can uh, also control the, the, the audio system. Um, so how, how many of you guys have heard about the CAN bus or know a little bit? about it, okay, about half. All right, so this is an internal system bus, so to speak, on, on the car. Uh, about 70 electronic control unit is used, uh, including very safety sensitive systems are connected to this bus, and they send messages, receive messages, uh, like transmission and, and brakes, airbags, Things like that. So it's definitely an area where you want to to keep quite secure from from any uh, vulnerabilities or, or third parties. Uh, there's also in this particular car there was a, a chip, uh, a B80 chip, which uh, were able to read from the canvas and then send diagnostics information to the um, uh, multimedia or the infotainment system. Uh, the reason that has to be there is because um, if the tire pressure is low, you've probably seen this happening, that you get a notification about this, um, or you're running out of oil, uh, or maybe there's something wrong with the brakes. Uh, you have to notify the driver about these things. Um, so there has to be some flow of information from this canvas to uh, this sort of higher level, uh, higher level uh, interface to the, to the user. Uh, but the good thing is that uh, this was designed in such a way that it's only possible to, to read, so the information flow should go uh, one way, uh, theoretically. So uh, obviously, 
if you change the logic in this chip, then you can make it also write to it. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Uh, because remember, the attackers already had the control over the, uh, the multimedia uh, system because of that vulnerability. Um, they were able to update this chip with new firmware. And uh, obviously, there should have been some uh, authenticity checks here so that not everybody can just update that chip. Uh, but there weren't. So now they can read and write to this canvas. And uh, that's uh, how you can put this all together, uh, where you have a cellular breach from um, the Sprint network, you have a vulnerability in the IVI system. You can update the firmware of this uh, V850 chip, so thereby gain read and write access to the canvas. And when you have that, then you can control the car remotely. So there's a couple of lessons. Obviously, the Wi-Fi hotspot uh, didn't get used in, in the end, but still, uh, Guessable credential is a common theme that we can recognize. Uh, and then there's a remote service that was accessible but vulnerable. This happens also in other systems, obviously. Uh, the V850 ships, as we mentioned, the update to that uh, did not have proper authenticity checks. Uh, and then, of course, when the disaster happened, then there is no way to fix it. Um, so there are some lessons we, we can take from, from this attack. And uh, obviously, as we mentioned, more and more software means more and more um, ways to attack the system. Uh, there's an average, or there's a statistic that there is one, between one and 25 bugs um, of every thousand lines of code. Uh, so if you guys are very good developers, maybe you're on the, you have two bugs per thousand lines. Uh, but um, it obviously depends on the, the um, development process being used and how fast you need something to market uh, versus focus on, on security, which sort of uh, range you end in. But the point is that uh, it's just a ratio. So the more software you have, uh, the more uh, vulnerabilities you have as well. Um, so what we should do in order to end up in a lower end here is to try to rely on more uh, well-maintained software instead of writing it ourselves. And there's also a couple of uh, very, uh, I don't know if I should say famous, but uh, well-known uh, security design principles. Uh, the principle of least privilege. Uh, if you don't need everything to be run as root, uh, uh, then you, you probably shouldn't, for example. Uh, separation of privilege, uh, uh, maybe a component like the, the media system didn't have to be uh, also able to directly write to this V850 chip. Maybe they could be separated, so if you compromise one of them, you wouldn't be able to uh, to carry out both these tasks, basically. Um, so separation of privilege, you see that all over the place, also in terms of uh, virtual machines and hypervisors and, and things like that. Um, and then Kirchhoff's principle uh, is about cryptography. So basically, it means that um, you shouldn't rely on security by obscurity. The only thing you should assume is um, Secret is the key that you use in, uh, in cryptography. So like the algorithms don't invent your own secret algorithm and hope that uh, nobody figures out how it works. All right. So um, here is um, the third piece of, of this uh, presentation. It's about patching, so we'll have a look at, especially in an embedded, why it happens so late. Uh, the picture you see here is from a, a broad research uh, uh, of information systems, and not just in embedded, but 
uh, basically tells you how um, so if you look at the bottom uh, axis, uh, then you will see days. So it's like 100 days and 200 days. I don't know if you can see it in the back. And then uh, at the uh, vertical, vertical, yes, vertical axis, uh, you can see the probability of a uh, exploit um, being public. So basically, um, after uh, after uh, uh, a vulnerability is found, so five to days after a vulnerability is found, uh, there is less than 10% chance that there is a public exploit for that vulnerability. Um, after 60 days, there is 90% uh, chance or more that there is an ex exploit. And then, uh, obviously the problem is that the average time uh, from uh, uh, like a vulnerability is found until it gets patched is 110 days, which leaves quite a big gap for uh, just taking a, a known vulnerability off the internet and just deploying it. Um, you have this huge window here. So obviously if you could move to this five to 10 day patch cycle from when you know it until it's actually fixed, then uh, you would have a much better uh, probability of surviving this. Um, so you could also ask why it happens. Uh, why do we not patch more frequently? Obviously, if you're in the field of security, it's um, hard to show value maybe until it's too late that you should have done it, but now uh, you can do other things until something bad ac actually happens. Um, so, so it's an invisible problem. Um, another thing is obviously uh, that it can be very costly or risky depending on how, how you do this or what kind of systems you're updating. Uh, maybe it's a manual process like in the Fiat Chrysler case where you have to drive the car to the, uh, to the retailer in order to get it updated. That's obviously not... Um, cheap enough. Uh, and then production downtime is also never a, um, a good thing in terms of risk. So these are some of the causes. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, so some of the things especially we have discovered in terms of uh, patching embedded devices, maybe some of you have as well. How, how many of you have built your own over-the-air updater at least once? Okay, six people. Uh, so about 10% maybe. Uh, so that's what we found a lot as well, that um, people tend to build uh, over-the-air updaters. Uh, uh, a lot uh, in uh, yeah in ho homegrown projects as part of development projects um, in the belief that it's a simple problem. What can go wrong because you're just downloading some binary and installing it and uh, maybe rebooting. Um, but uh, these are some of the extra problems that you will have in uh, in embedded uh, that you might not think about initially. So first. Uh, obviously, you have um, very expensive physical access to the embedded devices, so uh, if something does go wrong, then the device is bricked, as many call it, and then uh, what, what do you do then? Uh, maybe you have to recall it. Uh, you have unreliable power, so there could be a device that runs on battery, uh, or it could be uh, a user that just unplugs it. Uh, so you need to be able to handle this. What happens if you're updating the device and then you lose power? Or you're updating 1,000 devices and then two of them lose power? Um, so then you also have the, the connectivity issue on uh, embedded devices. could vary very widely. Uh, so it could be a 3G connection, uh, maybe even Wi-Fi, but typically more these um, low bandwidth uh, connections, and uh, uh, devices can move around, so you can, uh, you can lose connectivity, or it can be very intermittent. So uh, 
uh, when you do updates, then you have to, to manage that aspect as well. And of course, the security uh, aspect of the network itself. So you should assume that, um, or in general also, when you, uh, when you have embedded there and you use um, wireless technologies, you should always assume that somebody could be listening to it or injecting packages as well. Um, there's countless examples actually in OTA, just in the OTA space that uh, uh, you have some set-up box that just uh, screams to be updated and then the first, uh, first update that it gets, it will just install without any problems. So, so it's, it's pretty common, unfortunately. Uh, but these are some of the things you should uh, worry about if, if you work in uh, OTA updates. And also the reason why, especially cars, are a bit slow to adopt it because there are so many uh, things that, that to think about. Um, I won't go through all of this, but uh, this is the basic flow that you should follow for an, uh, or that an updater will follow. So first you, yeah, you detect and download it, obviously. And then there are some integrity authenticity checks to do. Uh, install it, and then uh, the last one is a bit interesting in terms of embedded. Um, what do you do when, when something goes wrong? So maybe you, you most likely want a, a rollback strategy in, in terms uh, of uh, recovery from, from broken updates. Um, so, also, there's a lot of different ways you can apply updates. So, uh, I think the most traditional way in Embedded is to do full image updates. Uh, so, there are a couple of uh, trade-offs in terms of the size and the installation time, um, the ability to roll back, and the consistency. Uh, so, consistency means basically if you test something in your test environment, it looks good, works, what is the probability it will work in the production environment? Uh, so that's what I mean with consistency in this context. So, um, so it's consistent between devices, basically. So with full image, this is pretty easy because, uh, well, uh, they are quite identical. The devices you have in te uh, test, you flash them with the same thing as you flash the production devices with. So, pretty good uh, sense of them being the same. Uh, but for example, if you have a package-based update, as the second column, uh, this is a bit more tricky because you might have different set of packages installed in these two environments, uh, maybe different versions of libraries. Uh, so that's why it's a bit more tricky to, to deal with consistency in, in package-based updates. Uh, also, rollback is a bit harder. Uh, I think package-based updates are what people typically start with uh, if they build their own. What did you guys use, those of you? Full image. Full image? Okay. Cool. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, rollback, of course. How do you do that with a package? It, um, if you uninstall it, it doesn't necessarily um, make it the same. So another one is also Docker or containers. That's an, sort of a newer version or sort of a newer approach to, to deploying updates. Um, that might be interesting. Um, so, how do you avoid uh, bricking in general? You probably can't, but uh, these are some basic things you can do to, to um, reduce the risk. So, uh, when you do an update of a device, you should have some kind of integrity check. So, typically, this comes in the form of a checksum. So, maybe a SHA-1 or SHA-256 of uh, so you ship the checksum with the, the data computed on the, 
on the remote end, and you uh, computer check them and you compare them, obviously, when uh, after you've done the installation. And uh, this is quite, you, you will catch basic problems with the network or, or storage corruption and, and things like that. And it's very easy to implement as well. So um, that's probably what you should start with. Uh, then rollback is also something we discussed briefly, but um, basically the ability to go back to the previous state if the, if the new version doesn't work for whatever reason. So it's kind of a catch-all uh, strategy where uh, if you lose power or connectivity or maybe just the application was incorrectly configured, you can still go back to the previous version. Uh, and this property is a bit more tricky to uh, develop unless you have designed for it up front um, in terms of what kind of uh, um, update you are deploying as well. Uh, and then an uh, interesting one is phased rollout. It has actually several names. Another name is campaign management. So all, all good IT um, words have many names, I guess. Uh, but uh, it's used by many big infrastructure in, in the server side as well, where, uh, for example, with Facebook, when they have a new, um, new feature they develop, they will uh, try to deploy it to maybe Australia first, or some part of Australia, or some users between 25 or 35. They have, have some way to segment it, depending on the feature. And then you do monitoring, and you see, OK, do we see any spikes of the traffic, or do we see any complaints from the users, uh, some I irregularities? Uh, if not, you can uh, include New Zealand also as part of the deployment, maybe. Uh, so, uh, um, and then you, you expand from there. Um, so you can segment it in, in any way that you want. Um, this is a very generic way uh, to reduce the risk of, of making changes in general, actually. And it's being used a lot. Um, and actually, you probably do this already because you have a test environment and a production environment. So uh, you kind of roll it through this these stages. Um, so, uh, the summary is that uh, in order to have more security in the car, we should try to use uh, open source software where there is no differentiation or at least very well maintained software and, and try not to um, try to focus on quality instead of quantity, I suppose. Um, and uh, there should be a way to also make changes to the devices, because as you know, as engineers, um, uh, things are not uh, perfect ever. So um, there needs to be a way to, to improve uh, the product after it, uh, it leaves the shop, basically. Uh, and then also this uh, well-known design principles we can, uh, or security design principles, Kirchhoff's principle and principle of uh, um, least privilege and, and separation. Uh, you can see those if you look at many of the attacks, then they could have been avoided if one or more of these have been applied. Um, if you look a bit deeper at what happened, like with this uh, Jeep Cherokee case. Um, and then uh, you can ask yourself this as well, uh, what happened um, after an attack. So uh, in the, your left hand side, you can see how Fiat Chrysler responded. It's a bit small, so I'll try to read it. Uh, after their uh, car got hacked, and uh, they said that uh, this required unique and extensive technical knowledge and uh, manipulating the software is, uh, constitutes a criminal action. Uh, and then Tesla actually got hacked in September 2016, quite recently. And then they say, oh, they, it was a, 
I think it was a Japanese uh, a security consulting company, a Keen Labs is their name at least. And they say that uh, they will pay them a monetary reward for it, their work and uh, they helped us find something that's a problem we needed to fix and that's what we did. So um, they have a quite different uh, methodologies and approaches uh, to, uh, to improving. Um, so that's also something to think about how, how do you uh, want to, to manage these processes. So with that, uh, I can take any questions or comments if anyone has. Please. So the question is if uh, if Mander, at Mander if we do any ex uh, third party penetration testing. Third party. Yep. Internal. Yeah. So yeah, we have one going on right now actually. So we have a, a third party um, uh, test doing black box testing right now, and we're also going to do uh, more of a white box uh, testing approach. <laughs> uh, so so we're planning to um, to continue this and do it regularly. Uh, Yes. Um, can you mention rollback as a double-edged sword? Because also in many update systems, we want to prevent rollback yeah. either by an intruder or by the user themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So in some some cases, you don't want the ability to roll back because uh, um, if you have version 1.0 of your product and you find a vulnerability, you upgrade to version 1.1 and then uh, and then an, if an attacker can make you go back to version 1.0, then they can still exploit the vulnerability. That's at least one case I know about. Was that what you were thinking about? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so sure. Um, I think there's a term for this, but I can't remember it right now. Um, but, but definitely, in some cases, you, you don't want um, uh, the ability to roll back. Um, so the type of rollback I was uh, talking about is more about uh, uh, are more automated rollbacks uh, when you actually do the update. So after you done the update, you might not ever want to go back to that uh, to that older version. And there are frameworks for this. There is one called the update framework. Have you heard about this? Tough. No. Okay. So there there are some frameworks that will basically prohibit. Uh, on the client side, from going backwards uh, to older uh, to older versions, and it sounds like a really easy problem, but like most things in security, it's quite hard actually. So, uh, any other questions? Yes, please. There are some special issues with doing patching on open source software relating to. Mm. Yeah. Do you have any insights about how that's practical to do in an automotive? To stay compliant with the licenses and still deliver patches in an automotive context? Yeah, so how can we stay compliant with uh, open source licenses um, when we do patching? So I know. It's it's a difficult question, uh, um, but um, you typically have to ship the um, um, the actual software, especially if you modify it. You have to ship the source code that you did modify, and um, there are some tools uh, for controlling this process. I'm not sure if you're familiar with like Yocto project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you are from. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm not close enough. Ah, okay. Oh, you're not uh, part of the project. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so then you know what I'm going to say. But there are there are some controls for how to uh, uh, to avoid certain types of licenses and uh, um, when you do the build or at least get a warning. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't have a very much more specific answer than that, sorry. But, yeah. 
Any other questions? No. Okay. So thanks a lot for coming and enjoy the conference.